Good, good. Nice to see you. <laughs> nice to see you too. And thank you so much, Frank, for joining the author's yeah. table. It's my pleasure. And thank you for uh, making that little shift for us. So. Well, of course. Absolutely. Sure. Anything for you, Frank. Well, it worked out. It yeah. just Things yes. kind of picked up a little bit, thankfully, that week. So that was good. So. Yes, and I understand, too. And that, that worked out really nice. All yeah. right. Well, this is great. Okay. Um, now, Frank, let, let's turn the clock back a couple of years to, to when you were nine years old. And you, have a, you experienced for the first time a day at the races. True. And, and and that was in 1937. Well, that's not when I saw it, no. but that's when the movie was made. <laughs> that is correct. It and, feels like 1937, <laughs> though. Now, now, what was your feelings and your thoughts when you saw that film? Well, it was it was uh, Brad. It was a breathtaking moment uh, when you're nine, ten years old. Everything is real, mm -hmm. and the imagination is running wild, and you're pure in your response, and I certainly was. Um, so I, I put on my television set and there were, there were the Marx Brothers, specifically Groucho and Chico, mm -hmm. doing a routine uh, that they'd done on the road first, I found out later, uh, the Tootsie Fruitsy ice cream Oh yes, scene. I love that scene. I do too, and it, even though it was in black and white, that was, you know, back when we were kids, that was not unusual to see black and white movies and love them as opposed to today where you know, it, it's hard to get younger people to watch. But to get to your question, I, I was transported. I, I just was uh, completely uh, taken by, by Groucho's uh, wise guy approach and his takes to the, to the audience, yes. uh, the yeah. asides. Yeah. Um, and I, I love the flow of that routine, the Tootsie Fruitsy ice cream scene where Chico is conning Groucho. Oh, yeah. And I just thought it was so funny. I became completely engaged and exhilarated by, by the build of that routine. And that night I went, uh, that same, that night uh, I went to uh, into bed and I shared a bedroom with my brother, Tony, and we reenacted as much as we could remember the Groucho and Chico scene. Awesome. I took on Groucho, he took on Chico. And uh, that was my, that's probably the first time I laughed out loud um, you know, from watching a film, something on a screen. Sure. And that stays with you. And so that was, it had a tremendous impact on me, obviously, because my life changed at that point. And I wanted to learn more and know more about them. And then Brad, that brought it into um, a study of comedy and their comedy first, and then comedy of that era, and then all comedy, and then the performing arts mm -hmm. uh, in general. Now here's, here's you at uh, 10 years <laughs> old. <laughs> Oh now, my God! Yes, yeah, it's, it's, I think I'm a maybe 11 years old oh, there. With, there's my brother Tony dressed as Harpo, and my brother John is Chico, and poor John got uh, yeah. uh, recruited for uh, for that. You know, he 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 jokes about going to you know we, we used to have Halloween parades in, in grammar school. He dressed up like Chico. Of course, no one knew who the hell he was. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, now your favorite film is Duck Soup. I would say so. It keeps changing, though. It seems like it used to, Duck Soup was generally my uh, my answer uh, because he's so brutally funny on that. I love the way he interacts with uh, Margaret Dumont. The writing, oh, yes. he's so brash, and it's such a fast moving film. But uh, you know, recently I saw Monkey Business on the big screen, and uh, he's spectacular. They're all spectacular. It's you know, and I yeah. it never was a favorite of mine. And I think because, Brad, I like when they're in positions of power. I like that, you know, when he's the head of a government or a lawyer or a doctor or a university head. Uh, so those had more appeal since I was, you know, like all of us kids taught by, you know, we had authority figures we had sure. to uh, sure. uh, bend to. And um, I was taught by nuns. So when I saw Groucho as the outsider, uh, uh, breaking rules, I thought that was very attractive. And ex again, exhilarating is the word that I keep thinking of. But um, I, I, I love much of A Day at the Races because some of the, the film is a little long and it's, it's, it's pretty heavy in terms of production uh, you know, numbers. So, but today we can go forward through all that, of course. But there's some wonderful scenes, hilarious scenes within a day at the races where I think he's transcendently funny, physically, verbally inspired, actually. Sure. Now, like Duck Soup, though, I my favorite scene or one of them is the mirror scene. Mm -hmm. You know, and I and I also recall, you know, up 
back in 1955, Harpo did that same scene with Lucille Ball. That's right. Well, I love the precision of the work, which is what I started studying as I got older and mm -hmm. became a student of comedy and performance, high school, college, and of course, up until now, you're always studying and absorbing and saying, and wondering why that works or seeing why that doesn't work, et cetera. And how would you fix it? It's hard for me to just sit through a piece, a play without analyzing it. Sure. And you know, what, you know, what, uh, as I return to the Marx Brothers comedies, I'm reminded of, of their precision and all the best are extremely precise and well rehearsed. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, you know, they had a great deal of at-bats. Now, film is a different thing. You don't have the same at-bats. Uh, you may have several takes or 20 takes, or sometimes with some of those MGM films, 40 takes under the um, direction of Sam Wood. But they became very fluid and very, um, you know, they took, you know, the first two films, Coconuts and Animal Crackers, are, you know, as you know, are Broadway shows that were, had pre-Broadway tryouts, they had the Broadway runs, they had the post-Broadway runs. That's a, that's, those are hundreds and hundreds of performances before they film Coconuts right. or Animal Crackers. And actually, you know, Coconuts, you can see the progression. You know, Coconuts, you can see like, it's almost like a volcano ready to erupt. You know, mm -hmm. you can watch their performances and you can just see that they're ready to just re let loose. It's know? true. They must have felt quite confined uh, mm -hmm. in some ways with the with the filmmaking process, uh, it, wanting it... to run rampant and mm -hmm. and go out of shot. Um, how could they not when they are, you know, when they've been performing on stage for twenty five plus years? Now, isn't that and true? knowing that? Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, Frank. Um, it, knowing it's... that that playing an audience, doing takes, jumping into the audience, yes. roughhousing was a way of survival, was a way to really glean probably most of the laughter, which was through improvisational activity, be, be it physical, verbal, or, or both. Right. So now, that must have felt restricting to them at now, times. Is that sort of true, like with, because uh, Duck Soup was the last one with Paramount Pictures, and mm -hmm. then they went to MGM, so they sort of felt that restriction again, in a way, right? Right, and the beauty of those MGM those films is that they did get to go back on the road and try those scenes out. Uh, producer at MGM, Irving Thalberg, that was a directive. It's like, mm -hmm. you're great because you're great stage performers and you know how to work an audience and you've tried, you try things out, you, you, you ever evolve. And so that's what happened with A Night at the Opera, A Day at the Races. Even some of the lesser MGM films, Go West was, up to, was taken on the road um and played throughout the united states and so they were able to take what they call block scenes those chunky comedy scenes and string them together and and they would time the laughs they would change a single word you know and during the course of of a run um and night at the opera the famous stateroom scene the crowded stateroom scene started off all the page said and i'm paraphrasing is that the marx brothers do some funny things in a stateroom <laughs> After so many weeks, they found out what those funny that's things right. were. But that's something that evolved. And that, to me, to this day, is one of the funniest scenes in film. It's so beautifully yes. facilitated and built and directed and edited and certainly performed. I mean, the kind of physical, what Harpo throwing his body, you can't, that's not, that's different every take. Yeah. The way he throws his body around in his comatose state, semi, you know, so-called <laughs> faux comatose, comatose yeah. state, and Chico's flirting with the manicurist. And Groucho's deadpan one-nighters, uh, one-liners are, are <laughs> stupendous. That's right. Now, now, when you were 13 years old, you were able to meet your idol, and who was that idol? That was that was Charlie Chaplin. That was Groucho <laughs> Marx, and uh, <laughs> and my father took the day off of work, and uh, Groucho was going was to appear at the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles. Uh, and the Ambassador Hotel was a legendary hotel that housed the Coconut Grove. Uh, it used to be you know, a nightclub, famously. The stars like Groucho himself and the Marx Brothers would go there for dinner and dancing and drinks. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this, this is the 30s and 40s. Uh, the Coconut Grove was no longer there. It's the same the ballroom in which uh, Robert F. Kennedy was assassinated. But so that there's a lot of, a lot of history to that Ambassador Hotel. Actually, I wanted to show and you it, this. 
Oh yeah, that's yeah, that's me between Groucho Marx yeah, and Aaron Fleming. Right there, yeah. Yeah, and two on the other on um, we're flying next to Groucho's Hex, Hector Arce, who was the, his biographer of a book. I think it's the best book on Groucho Marx called Groucho okay. by Hector Arce, A R C E. In terms of covering him from birth to death and giving us a kind of a, kind of his a psychological take on him, it, 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 it's, he's, it's a very fair. And on the very on the very other side, on the uh, far uh, to my far right. Uh, from where I'm looking at you right now is John Tepteller, who's who's a, who worked for Groucho, who's still a friend of mine, and he uh, he is now putting together uh, all the missing, no longer missing Marx Brother radio shows. That's John Tepteller, so he'll be coming out with a lot of new material. So to get back to the event is my <laughs> father Groucho was slated to show at noon. This is sept late September of '76. He was just short of his 86th birthday. It's October 2nd. And uh, he doesn't show up. And then the host of this event, it was a book event, a uh, book fair. And they said, you know, Groucho's not well. He's going to be late. Henry Miller was slated to be there. He canceled. Um, uh, Ray Bradbury was at this event. It was a lot of heavy hitters. But Groucho did eventually show up three hours later. And uh, I followed him. I, uh, there he was in beret and a suit and open shirt, Marx Brother with Marx Brother likenesses, a print shirt. And he was there with Aaron Fleming, who was the controversial figure in his life, who was his manager, caretaker, whatever you wanted to call her, maybe girlfriend. Um, so I just followed them from the car to the lobby of the ambassador, and there were a thousand people there, Brad. And, Mostly young people, kids like myself, a lot of college age kids who, you know, Groucho represented irreverence and, mm -hmm. and you know, the, the anti-establishment movement of the late 60s and 70s. This is just post Vietnam mm -hmm. uh, war uh, and it was still very much in the ethers. Uh, and he became a hero. Duck Soup is perceived as, you know, as an anti-war film. And Groucho was outspoken about his feelings about Nixon and the Vietnam War, and that resonated with a generation, a young generation. And he had a gigantic following that time amongst college age students and younger. He shows up, I follow him. He, they don't know what he should do. Should he go behind a, a, a table and sign books or shake hands? And Aaron Fleming was, no, he won't. He's not gonna be treated like a freak. I remember her saying that. And everyone was cleared away in the lobby and they start walking R.C. and Fleming and Groucho to the podium in the, at the Ambassador Hotel at the uh, ballroom. And I, I had a book of his that he wrote, The Secret Word is Groucho, under my arm, and wearing my, now I realize, 1970s style shirt. And I just, I just stuck to him as if I was part of his entourage. Everyone else was clear, but I, was, I, was, I could smell his old spice on his <laughs> cologne. I was that close. Wow. So he gets to the podium and he stands yeah. at the podium and I'm feet away from Superman, you know, the funniest man in the world. And I still maintain that's who he is. Mm -hmm. uh, and long after we're all gone, we're going to be people who watch those films and be moved and laugh. And, and, and it, was, it was very moving, but he looked awful. He was so frail and older than than I could have ever imagined. I, I was watching him on some TV shows and he was in bad shape, but not this bad. Uh, he, he didn't look, he looked like a human being, which I didn't, we didn't want to see. He looked like an old man, which is not who he is to us. He was a God mm -hmm. in a way sure. to, to, to loved him. And um, he was symbolized a great deal to particularly those of us who were meek, shy, uh, not always able to express themselves, which is almost all of us. His his persona did that. So there's a so he gets up there. He shuffles to the podium, and he's he's glassy eyed and uh, almost looked like an old statue, really, with that beret and the glasses, slightly hunched. And uh, I asked the first question. I said, "I asked, when is the book coming out?" And the host of the event, and Groucho just turned to the host and said, "Tell him." And that's it. They told us it'll be January of 77 and nothing was really happening for the first moments. And all of us were going thinking he might drop dead at any point. It was, it was shattering. I asked a question in my 13 year old brain that I thought would steam him up, that would kind of rile him up. And this is how I thought, 
and I knew how he felt about Nixon because the FBI had a file on him. He once said, he once asked, you know, he thought the best thing that happened to the country was Nixon's assassination. He was in his 80s when he said that, not something you're supposed to say <laughs> without, you know, <laughs> and uh, unless you're going to, uh, there'll be, unless you, you know, it just <laughs> wasn't a good idea. It was in the Berkeley Barb that he was quoted. Anyway, so I asked him, so Gra I said, Groucho, what do you think about Nixon? And he just said, <laughs> I hate Nixon. Nixon ought to be in jail. And of course, that young audience erupted oh, yeah. with with applause. And then things started flowing. Actually, you know, it's like he was you know, someone had flipped a switch, and I think it was me broke the ice in my mind. <laughs> and then, uh, and then I asked him. Uh, people asked other questions. Groucho, uh, what what do you dream about? And he looked at the woman and said, "Not you." <laughs> the huge laughs. Some of some Groucho, are you making any new Marx Brothers movies? Took a long pause and he goes, No, I'm answering stupid questions. <laughs> and again, the the body was shot, but the mind was still mm -hmm. was still going, the gears were still turning. And so he did probably maybe 10 minutes, maybe. Uh, asked, and, and did he held his own. He was done, he deflated. And he went, he left the stage, left stage right, went down these uh, very steep outdoor stairs, like a stairwell outside the building to go back to his car. I mean, I don't know how he navigated these steel, these mm -hmm. metal stairs. I, and I was at the top of, of the stairwell watching him go down. And he was below me. And I have a photo from that moment that my cousin took, who was also 13. And I yelled at the top of my lungs from the top of the stairwell. And there he's below. I went, Groucho's great, just unfiltered, pure. And he kind of looked up and went, and I have a photo of that. And then I ran down the stairs and I followed him and I tried to get in. I tried to talk to him. I want, you know, but he was flanked uh, by uh, Hector Arce and Aaron Fleming. And I said to Aaron Fleming, I said, uh, Your, uh, Groucho sure is lucky to know you, I said, and, and trying to ingratiate myself. Sure. And, uh, you're lucky to know Groucho. And she said, no, Groucho's lucky to know me. Mm. Can you imagine? Mm -mm. And then I said, well, yeah, well Groucho's great. It was, uh, and then he started going toward his Cadillac, his car, his t town car, I think, black car. And uh, I said to my cousin, take a photo of Groucho from behind. Mm -hmm. it, it'll be, uh, in my mind, it was cinematic, see him in silhouette. And I have a photo of Groucho from behind in the beret. And then he went into the car and off, you know, he, and in, into the sunset. And it was a kind of a foggy, misty California day. It was very odd, the weather. It just seemed very fitting. It wasn't a sunny California day. It had a dreamlike quality to it in terms of the atmosphere. I never talked about this at, at such length. But that final shot of him in silhouette, you know, 10 years to that week, Brad, I portrayed Groucho Marx in New York as an 85-year-old man, that man that I just spent those moments with. And the end of Groucho Life and Review, the last thing you, that play, written by Arthur Marx, Groucho's son, who mm -hmm. discovered me at USC, the last, the last moment in Groucho Life and Review was me as old Groucho in Beret, from behind in silhouette, I must be going. I turn from the audience. There's a pin spot, blackout. And I and, and that's who would have thought that 10 years later, at 23 years old, I'd be in New York and then London. That's, uh, that's... Sharing his life and legacy mm -hmm. with, with an audience that thankfully in, appreciated it, as did the critics. And it's very, very fortunate. It's very strange how certain things manifest in life. But Is I'm there a reason for everything. Yeah, I don't know why I got to be the one. I remember when I was 15 years old, and I remember I don't know what I was praying to at the time, but I remember thinking I want to make people laugh the way Groucho makes me laugh. And then in my mind, I said I want to be nominated for a Tony Award for that. I was too. I didn't. I didn't want to be too greedy. I didn't say when. I said, I wanted to be nominated for a Tony Award. And nine years later, I was nominated for the equivalent of a Tony Award in London, the Olivier Award for Comedy Performance of the Year. And I was 24 years old. So, wow. you know, yeah. 
uh, you know, I don't know what to say about things like that. You know, uh, God works in mysterious ways, Frank. I don't know what it is, but uh, I think we have a lot. I think we have the capacity. There's a there. I don't know about God or anything, but the, certainly there's a spiritual component. I think mm-hmm. to our experience, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, this was a this was an act of spirit. When you share someone's spirit with others, I just did the show almost forty years, thirty nine years after the first. Let's see, I did it in nineteen eighty five. So the first time in a dinner theater before we went to New York and London, and I just did the role again, playing Groucho from age fifteen to eighty five. To say that was moving is is an understatement. Mm-hmm. And, um, right. yeah. You know, on your 22nd birthday, uh, you know, your senior project, uh, you, you were performing as Groucho on stage, and you had some very special guests in the audience. And who were they? Well, that was um, Maury. It was at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles, where, where I was born. I was born in downtown L.A. and grew up in the suburbs in the San Gabriel Valley, the Sierra Madre, Pasadena area. But in that audience and how, why they would show up, I mean, I invited them. I invited about 100 people and probably the three most important people to Groucho who had, been, who had died in 1977. Now it's 1985. He's still very much part of the, our collective consciousness. Uh, in the audience was Maury Riskin, who was 89 years old, who had written... Um, the screenplay for The Coconuts, but co-wrote with George S. Kaufman, Animal Crackers, sorry, Animal Crackers, A Night at the Opera. He was, he was Groucho was his best man at his wedding. Um, he won a Pulitzer Prize for a The I Sing, Academy Award, I believe, for a Penny Serenade. And this was a major mm-hmm. writer of, of film and uh, for the stage, he was there. Maury Riskin was in the audience, the shrunken, lovely gentleman who was still witty. Uh, it was my 22nd birthday, as you said, and he said to me at the reception afterward, I hear you're all of 22. Isn't it time you retired? <laughs> he was in the audience, Groucho Marx's daughter, Miriam, who had kind of disappeared from the public eye decades prior because of her alcoholism, and she went into recovery the year her father died in 1977. You never saw her on television. She was not written about, she was a mystery then, but someone had given me her phone number and her address and uh, we corresponded and she was there, Miriam Marks Allen, Groucho's daughter, beloved daughter. And then Arthur Marks was there, Groucho's son, who was a writer and a playwright and had a play that had been tooling around with Gabe Kaplan and others, uh, you know, in dinner theater, in the, you know, in various theaters in the country. Uh, it, oh, it was shot for HBO in 1982, right the, early on in HBO's uh, development as a, you know, as a platform, as a cable network, I guess it was back then we'd consider it. And, um, that play, Groucho, is portrayed from age 15 to 85. And I saw it. I was in college, and I saw it with Gabe Kaplan, first uh, at Pepperdine in Malibu, where it was broken in and filmed. And then it moved uh, to the Westwood Playhouse, which is now uh, the Geffen, with Robert Hedges as Chico. And it was fine. And I met Arthur there. I met Arthur in Pepperdine. I was 19 years old. We, who knew that we'd become best friends and work together? But I got I have his autograph on a program for Groucho, Gabe Kaplan and Groucho. Can you imagine? I was going to be the guy that I know. four years later, I'd be playing that show in New York, in London. It To me, it's, it's an insane thing. Um, and so I met Arthur, probably 80, 1982. And then uh, I met him again I think, at the, uh, at the, in the bathroom at the <laughs> Westwood Playhouse. And that was that. And so, but I thought, you know what? I think I could do this, Brad, is what I said. The thing that I really liked was that the the old man scene, Groucho had not been portrayed in such a way. And I, and, and I don't mean to take away from Gabe, but Gabe would admit that he couldn't really sing or dance. He really, he wasn't an actor by trade. He was a fantastic, you know, mm-hmm. a great stand-up comedian, a very successful person in many fields. But uh, the show was rewritten well, I'm jumping ahead, but 
that performance was in April 26, my 22nd birthday. And in the audience are Groucho's Kids and Maury Riskin. And the audience, you know, about 500 people at the Bing Theater. And it was a hit. And I was terrified. I would broken it in in 84 in a church hall. Literally, I'm under an altar. That should have been a good sign that, you know, that this thing was somehow blessed. Yeah. But that's where the show first was done in 84 in August, the weekend. It was the anniversary of Groucho's passing. And that was part of the eight units, the two semesters of, of, of units that I received. And so it broke in in, in Sarah Madre, in my hometown, in a church hall. And then it played right before I graduated in April of 85. That's when Arthur Marx was there. And after the show, Arthur Marx said to me, if I ever do a show, that show about my father again, I'd like to use you. I thought, oh, yeah, right. But I didn't sleep for three days. That I did not, literally, I was so high from this experience. Oh, sure. Absolutely. And lo and behold, I graduate and uh, there's a dinner theater interested in Groucho and Arthur recommended that recommended me for the job. There's no reason I should have gotten it. I'm a no name. I'm 22 years old. I'm a student, no experience. And yet he fought for me and the producers were fine. It's like, listen, as long as he's good, that's okay. And that's how it started. And so in the, I graduate in May of 85 in fall of 85, I'm performing my hero's life from age 15 to 85 downtown Kansas city in a dinner theater. And the show was rewritten to cater to my youth. I played Groucho from age 15. It's not, it didn't start now at the movie Groucho. They were, because I was in my twenties, sure. they were able to do some rewrites and some cuts and reshape it. So the show that gave it is different, certainly. And, and the one it became a different new, different nuanced piece that wound up in New York and London. And so that's what happened. And, uh, it, it was a big success in Kansas city. And the reviews were embarrassingly good. And I couldn't believe I was being paid for this, op this whole situation. I would have done it for free. I would have paid them. I didn't <laughs> tell them that. But I think it was like $750 a week, which I thought was a fortune. And in some ways, it still is And when you look at the kind of contracts that, that are in the theater and regional theater. But, but I was a star of a show. And anyone else would have been getting $5,000 a week, probably, who was a star. But I didn't care. Um, but uh, and so the gentleman that owned this dinner theater and they still work in the dinner theater business in uh, new in the at the new theater in Overland Park, Kansas, very successful operation. Uh, they wanted to produce in New York, and so they raised four hundred fifty thousand dollars, and that show closed late eighty five, and we opened in fall of eighty six off Broadway at the Lucille Hotel wow. with a newly revamped script. Faith Prince was in that production who went on to win a Tony Award for Guys and Dolls. And um, it was quite a thrill. That's awesome. Yeah. I bet it was. Yeah. A absolutely. Now, you, before each performance, you have a phrase. And what is that phrase? Well, I always, and, and I have to remind myself, which is share, when I'm really nervous or if I'm distracted or considering you know, issues in regard to the show, and I just try to get into a Zen like, uh, mindset when I just say share the joy you know mm -hmm. that's basically what you, I need to do is share the joy that I experience when I watch Groucho and the Marx Brothers uh, at their best and uh, the joy of performance you know that's really the bottom line I love what I do whether it's you know we're talking about this role but I've been very fortunate to do all kinds of roles uh, mm -hmm. on stage and uh, musicals and plays and also have love being a director almost more than a performer because there's something in a way uh, egoless about it you're really serving you know you know you're not that the attention is not upon you and it to me it's um it's it's um satisfying to help others and to be able to see oh one more if you hold for one more beat you'll get a laugh oh. <laughs> or, or or if you yeah. come in sooner or if you step to this you know to the right here but that's that's technical, but also to be able to speak to a, an actor about what you're going for in terms of the nature of a character or, or the piece. You know, you can speak in broad terms, specific terms, but also being able in a position to cast really brilliant, deserving artists is a, that's a privileged position to be in. And I love performers and actors and people in the theater and creative artists. So I like I like to be a guide and. Um, 
I haven't done it enough, but I've done quite a, I've directed quite a few plays and musicals, and some of them I've actually been in as well. Now, for for forty years, over three thousand performances as Groucho, and that's a lot of corkscrew leg dancing too. <laughs> <laughs> that's a lot of leg twirls. <laughs> that's right. Still can do it, thankfully. <laughs> now, how many years have you performed Groucho: A Life in Review? Well, it's I can't I cannot tell you exactly. I'd have to really calculate that. I hadn't I hadn't done it for. 18 years the last time i had done it and until recently when i played yes. philadelphia at the walnut street theater and congratulations so, too thank you that was uh, imagine going from you know first doing something at age 22 and then being 60 and re <laughs> and returning to this material and here um here you go frank yep. yeah that's from that's from the new york production mm -hmm. and that photo was taken by martha swope who's a legendary um photographer of New York theater and there in the behind me are the four stages of Groucho's life that I take mm -hmm. on. There's Groucho at 15, Groucho in his forties from the film era to the far right Groucho from you bet your life. And of course with the beret, it's Groucho at age, age 85. So it's 15 ager, forties, sixties, eighties. And uh, it's funny. It, it's so great to be able to do it now. Cause I feel I'm better now than I was 40 years ago, 35 years ago. No, I've had more life experience, Brad, yes, and yes. that makes a difference. I, I you know, people have been asking me about what's it like to play this role again, this particular piece, almost forty years later. And of course, it's moving. But when I was twenty two, twenty three, twenty four, my life experience was extremely limited. And since then, there's been all kinds of things: right. loss, death divorce, financial challenges as a, as a freelancer, all the things Groucho went through, you know? So I knew more about Groucho Marx when I was 22, 23, 24 than I did about myself because there was no self. I was unformed. I was a kid, a kid that actually grew up in a fairly protected environment, a suburban upbringing um, with wonderful parents and extended family. But what am I pulling on? I was acting. That's what you do. Right. And that's what I did. I made up, you know, I used my imagination to make him come to life and try to channel his life when I was 22, 23. That's what actors do, you know, act, you know, as a Lawrence Olivier act, you know, what do you, act, my boy, act something. There's that great story of Dustin Hoffman, who was, a, you know, method actor. And, you know, I couldn't, I could only imagine what his life was like. And the older I get, the more I appreciate him and have empathy for him and understand his struggle. But here I am now having gone through all of that and that's certainly i can relate mm -hmm. to his life in many ways but also when i returned to the show almost 40 years later many of the players are no longer alive arthur marx and robert fisher who wrote the show are no longer alive mm -hmm. miriam who was alive the last time i did it 18 years ago is no longer alive and i refer to them in the show as my children it's a meta thing mm -hmm. And um, it's a profound thing. And the set designer who created the set for Groucho in New York and London is no longer with us. And people have left show business. You know, it's a hard racket. Like, you know, one of the actors in that show retired from the theater. And you, see, you know, either you can handle it or you can't handle it. And, um, you know, if I, if I had zero limbs, I would still be in show business because that's, I love it so much. And Don't I feel compelled to tell stories in the you know in the theater sure. as a theater artist so and to do the show at groucho's favorite theater which is the walnut street theater in philadelphia knowing that those ghosts are still there the marx brothers played there 100 years ago this time that's correct imagine that and it's one of the you know the theater's 215 years old it's yeah they're the marx brothers and i'll say she is and mm. and that was in 1923, I believe, correct? Yeah, 23. And then they reached, they, yeah. they had the longest, to this day, they had the longest continuous run at the Wall Street Theater, three months. And they went back in 1924, around in April, so around this time, uh, right before the Broadway move. So they had so much, so they did, they were smashed in 23. Then they took their show on the road, came back to the Walnut, where they had this incredible success, and then went to Broadway. At the, and um, 
you know, I, I thought, I think about them when I'm doing that show or doing the monologues. I had these beautiful monologues where Chico died today, October 11, 1961. So there I am sitting on that stage at a piano, you know, waxing philosophical about this relationship with brother Chico, knowing that those two guys were doing comedy on that very spot that I'm, that kind of feels sacred to me. Oh, sure. And at the very end of the show, mm -hmm. I say goodbye to all the brothers. Good night, Hoppo. Good night. You know, I do a beautiful monologue. Good night, Chico. It's, I don't know who else has had the experience that I got to have it's doing. It's very touching. Yeah, it's it's quite beautiful. And the audience mm -hmm. goes for it. And uh, they don't, you know, I, they don't have to be marks. With a, I always think a good story, Brad, is a good story. And you're in the business of storytelling, as am I. And you don't have to know who they are if the story's good, if the writing's good. It's my job to let them know that this is special and engaging and, and worth their attention. That's correct. And that's what I think this show accomplished. You know, I went on the um, people that attend, people came from all over the country to see the show. I'm not saying in droves, but people were coming from Seattle to Philadelphia, taking trains from New York and Connecticut and coming from Baltimore and flew in from Omaha. And, People who knew of the show, people who were marked with the fans, people who are fans of Groucho Life and Review, who remember seeing it, you know, back in the day elsewhere. A young man, an actor, took a bus, took a bus from Columbus, I think it was Colum Cleveland, Ohio. That's where he came in from, Cleveland. And he, and he just saw it twice, two times in a row. Took a bus. Hmm. I mean, it means a that lot, be, it, it is like, I don't know, it's a, it's a beautiful thing. And, um, I love being attached to that tradition of the theater, certainly, and comedy. And, and I've been thinking a lot about Hal Holbrook today because he mm -hmm. popped up on a memory in, on Facebook. And he became a, a friend of mine in the last years of his life, eight years or so. And I was at his 95th birthday a couple of years ago. And of course, he's since passed on. And he was the greatest. He's the one who popularized the, uh, the one-person show. That's correct. Uh, in the 1960s, he was on television. 20 plus million people watched him on CBS, I think in 1967, do his show. Back when there were three channels and and all eyes were upon you if you were on television. Right. <laughs> and he never stopped working. He worked mm -hmm. all the way until he was 92 years old. He died at 95. I saw him this last year of performance. And he treated me uh, certainly like a friend and a colleague, we were friends, mm -hmm. but said, you know, he would say, you're the, you're the natural successor. You're the logical successor. And the most beautiful thing he said to me, I'm digressing, but this is all related to spirit and this tradition. He said to me, keep it going, keep it going. And I know what that means because he went through ups and downs and dealt with his own demons and, and relationships and employment and unemployment, all the things that we can't control when you are a, a, like a performing artist. And I loved him very much. He was a great man. Mm -hmm. He was. Um, now, now, Frank, in uh, 2001, from San Francisco, mm -hmm. you, have, you created a, a, an alter ego. Yes. And this, this is this, <laughs> this, the, the, the Caesar. Yes, it is. So how, how did this character come about? You know what happened? I uh, a lot of things. I'm just having this conversation of how, how rage certainly can motivate and anger. You know, for 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 humans in terms of getting things done. I was doing a a benefit in 2000 for a, a corral in Woodland Hills, and I was happy to get it. I was unemployed. It was a tough time in my life. And uh, I took this benefit and paid, you know, a nominally paid. And I figured I, I need whatever I can get. So I did this so-called benefit performance. And there was a, I don't know, there was a 10-foot Steinway piano. And it needed to be moved. This is like less than half an hour before the show. And I'm starting to get ready. And there was no one to help me there. And the guy that was producing the event, I guess, expected me to, like, move this piano. So I'm moving this freaking piano. I'm going, I don't think Hal Holbrook is moving his pia the piano right, you know, piano right now. You know, I remember thinking like, oh. and um, 
but I did it and uh, I was angry about it. It's like, you know, I was, my ego uh, was in play yeah. and it's like, come on. And, uh, but I went on to do that performance and I absolutely ripped it up. There was so much improv and I had such an edge and enough anger that was tempered enough to not be completely offensive to the audience, but they were hysteric. They were in hysterics. And in that audience was a guy named Stuart Gordon, who was a great producer and creator. He did a Honey, I Shrunk the Kids and he did the Reanimator. He was in the audience and he is best friend was a guy named Norman Langell. And what he did is he saw me go off and do improv. He contacted his friend, Norman Langell, who ran a circus, a circ show called Teatro Zanzani, which was this show that had run successfully in, in Seattle and now was in San Francisco. Is a tent show, I mean, high end. I mean, not like some crummy show. I mean, this was like a European style circ show with it was like a $150 ticket and up, and it was a big deal. Full orchestra is a 100-year-old tent. And uh, they flew me out to see the show, and I was blown away. The light, the production element, the props, the sets, the, the environment. We're right on the Embarcadero, Pier 26, 27 in San Francisco. It was bre- it about breathtaking. It was, and it was like vaudeville. So it had magicians and singers and Later, Joan Baez did the show and Tony Award winner Lilian Montevecchi. I worked with both of them eventually. So I saw the show and they and eventually within a, a year later, I'd given up on getting hired. A year later, they said, we'd like you to join us. And that's what I did. I didn't know what the hell they wanted me to do. I thought they wanted me to do the same thing that the other host was doing, Kevin Kent, who did drag. Great comedy, great comic performer, Kevin Kent. Um but you know he did an evangelist he did a matador but would close doing this character called cookie who was like billy holiday and he was funny and witty very very great ad great ad libber and i thought oh they want me to do his act is no we want you to come up with your own thing i said what what do you mean i've never done that before i'm an act a straight actor i have a one-man show i and so that's what that's when it started my life changed with that because i had I ended up creating this character called the Caesar, which is this Latin lover character, which of course has been done millions of times, but I had to put my own spin on it, which I did. And the character loved everything, everyone. He was this polysexual character. He he loved women, men, dogs, cats, (laughs) uh, you know, a a moccasin, nothing was safe in his presence. And he would, he was unbridled with his passion. He loved to drink. He loved to, you know, he play, you know, he was, he was a wild, character and Kevin is uh, Kevin is a, a gay man and so he, he, there was a lot of tension with what he did because he'd bring other straight men up and 20 years ago pre Ellen DeGeneres it was still a scary thing to see a man in a dress and looking you know at playing with a straight male publicly mm-hmm. in the round in this beautiful hundred year old Belgium tent people would gasp and laugh well, I said, I'm not gay, but I can play <laughs> a character that, you know, that loves everything. I can relate to that. And so my guy was this wild. So you couldn't really judge him. And Kevin gave me the, the best compliment. He says, Frank, everyone knows what I am. Nobody knows what you are, which is also disturbing to people because we want to label and brand. Mm-hmm. So the character became popular with all kinds of audiences and demographics and ages because he was free. So he's wild and he's physical and he's loud and you know and he was a takeover guy and he, and he loved showbiz and he had a machismo yet was also fey and light and we didn't know where he would go and very audience interactive I would I had, had I did about forty five minutes of material in this three hour show almost a third of the show and I'd bring people on stage and it really was inspired by vaudeville by the Marx brothers by Groucho Mm -hmm. that having that kind of bravery. I was so scared. The first time I did it, I was trembling, but it's now been about 2000 performances and over 20 years doing this in Seattle, long run. So the, Mm -hmm. the community gets to know you. I did it Chicago for almost a year in the theater district. So you get to know the media, you get to know the audiences, you get to know merchants around you. And that is, you know, one nighters I played over 500 cities, Brad, around the world. That's great. But when you can sit down in a community like Seattle, Chicago, San Francisco, New York, that's also great. Yeah. That that and and you can you can 
you know you can create some long lasting friendships and uh, and that's what i've been able to do and a friendship with a with a city i feel very when i go back to chicago uh, there's an audience for me in my in a, in a little way i'm not saying i'm you know elvis but i but you you're building a, a little following and as i get older boy i appreciate absolutely people that are there so to answer your question uh, that became uh, remarkable. You know, Robin Williams showed up to see me uh, at Teatro Zinzani. I mean, to <laughs> me, next to Groucho, yeah. wh who's a better improv. I mean, and I made him laugh. I made him laugh. And he, and I know he was, a, and I'm not saying I'm special because he was generous in his response to performers. And he laughed till he was in tears. And this was a benefit at Teatro Zinzani in San Francisco. And I said, when I was a boy, and he was maybe 50, only 15 years older than I am. He's not, we're not that, we're not a generation apart, but when I was a boy, I'm watching him mm -hmm. unhappy, you know, Mork and Mindy and yep. Good Morning Vietnam and all, you know, and he is, and, and his concerts. And there's no one better. There's just no one better. I mean, he was like a hurricane. That's right. And so I'm making one of the greatest laugh. And in the audience was my father, who at the time I was estranged from, and my drama teacher. And they're at that audience and they're facing, they're positioned to see Robin Williams laugh. And after that performance, Robin Williams came up to me and goes, Frank, Frank, come here. And I went, he goes, you killed, you killed. And that's the highest praise you can get from one comedian to another. And I've never thought of myself as a comedian or comic actor, but I've become a comic entity because of that Caesar character and because of my work as Groucho and just doing musicals in the regions and, and plays. And, um, you know, I, I have friends who are great actors and versatile and they do, they've done hundreds of roles. I can't claim that, but I can claim that I've, that I've taken on some persona that I've been able to evolve and take on the road and work audiences with. And I'm really proud of, cause I've gotten better, I think over, over time. You know, I got Sean Penn would come to the show. George Lucas would come to the show. Uh, it was a, a heady experience performing uh, the Caesar character in this spectacular Cirque realm. Very, very fortunate to, you know, to be in that, again, a privileged position as the comic lead. Absolutely. And hearing laughter never gets old, Brad, as you That's know. Right. And more yeah. now than ever. I mean... Uh, it's a it's a beautiful thing to hear people laugh, and I it's my uh, my feelings about it have changed. I used to do it when I was young for myself because it made me feel good. I needed it. I needed to feel affirmed and special. And I don't feel the same way as I get as I've gotten older. I'd like that I that others that it thrills me that people are responding for them. And I don't why, get the same feeling mm -hmm. from it that I would have 30 years ago or 20 years or 10 years ago. And that's why it's so important that you keep doing what you're doing. I Sp appreciate that. Well, of course, spreading the joy on that. That's, you know, what we need more than ever. Yeah. Yeah. I feel yeah. really grateful. Yes. Very grateful for, for it. Yeah. Uh, uh, real quick, uh, Frank, mm -hmm. um, I, I can go for a part two, but, uh, <laughs> um, I know you, you have so many accomplishments, and uh, and I know one of them, and which I have from you, is the DVD. Ah. And and uh, this this is, uh, I have to say, one of your biggest things that my wife and I enjoyed watching. Thank you. Well, of course, and um, and especially because it's on PBS. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I mean, this is just one of many, and then and then you have this as well that I like to share. And I think this is very important too. I think that's huge. Yeah, that was meaningful to me. You yes. know, particularly coming off of a pandemic. Absolutely. Uh, it, it was a it was a, a star on the walk of stars in in Palm Springs. Yes. And uh, my whole family was there. My parents, who are long divorced, they were we were all together. My brothers, yeah. and a lot of the Marx family were there. Harpo's son was there. Groucho's mm -hmm. grand uh, Bill Marx. Yes. Uh, Arthur Marx's son. Who I love very much. Yeah, Andy. Uh, Groucho's grandson Andy was there. Uh, Groucho's great grandson Ethan was there. Uh, so for me, it meant a lot. So the the Ferrante family was there. The Marx family was there, and a lot of friends from different parts of my life were at that ceremony a couple years ago. The DVD, the the PBS production. You know, from you know to get back to where we started, from a church hall, 
to PBS. Absolutely. That's what happened. It only took, what, 40 years. Hey. And here we are. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but you know, I'm proud of it. You know, Drea Weber was the director of it. It's beautifully edited. It's about as close to experiencing the show as you can get in a filmed version. I'm very proud of how it's edited. It's in one act, one straight through act. It's normally a two act comedy with music, as you know. But this is straight through. And it's still, you can still, it's still available on PBS Passport. You can stream it on Broadway On Demand. You can order the DVDs. I would, and, love, I would love to see the, uh, a life in review and uh, yeah. in PBS. That would be awesome. I would, you know, it was, it was on PBS, but it was 22 years ago. Right. It's, and it's not the same. That right. was kind of cut. It was really cut up quite a bit to fit the pledge break. And quite frankly, the show is better now. And, um, I thought that was just okay, but I wanted it got on TV, but it doesn't represent really Groucho a Life and Review the way I wish it had. It's unlikely that a Life and Review will wind up. It's it was tough enough to get this one person show on PBS to raise the money to get it edited, sure. and it really the pandemic the one the, one of the few positive things that came out of the pandemic was the time to edit this piece. It took four sure. months because there was footage. You know, we had four different performances that's cut from three different three or four different angles including a remote you know a handheld camera andrea weber had that we had nothing going on we were we were in lockdown she used three cameras too i believe right three cameras there was maybe maybe yeah, three stationary cameras and then she did that she herself operated the handheld there's a great behind the scenes extra on the dvd it's not on anywhere else where she talks about yes how we developed it and uh, That's awesome. really she cool. was a, she was like a superhero trying to, to making that work I have mm -hmm. to say so yes um, b before we go Frank um, can you recommend like one of the like Marx Brothers books that that you can say that it's very thorough and informative mm -hmm. what, what, what I would uh, there are there are two that come to mind. Um, Robert Bader, who's a wonder, who's a good friend of mine, who's done probably more for the Marx Brothers legacy than just about anyone alive. He keeps he's got a book on Zeppo coming out. That's how. Oh wow. That's how specific. That's how that's how immersed he is in the in the legacy of the Marx Brothers. And he put out Susan Mar Harpo's widow's book came out mm -hmm. because of him. He did the Cavett the Cavett Groucho PBS documentary. He helped me get my one man show on PBS through his generous, you know, mm -hmm. suggestions and con and contacts. Um, he also put you bet your life on DVD, you know, he did the best of and the funniest of, and, uh, he's done a great deal. He did the ascent. He did the writings of Groucho or, or you know, mag his magazine pieces. He published those. That's all, that's all Robert Bader, but Robert Bader has a book that is now in a, a, a new edition is out called for the three musketeers which yes. deals with the early marx brothers career on stage and it's very it's meticulously researched and beautifully written and the book on groucho that covers really his i mentioned before hector arcy's groucho yes. Yes. really takes on groucho's private life and career in, in a parallel manner that is an empathetic take on him that i appreciated and and RC knew Groucho personally, as as evidenced in that photo that, that you showed when we when I first met him. Um, so I would say those are great, wonderful pieces to see. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, to read. Yeah, here's one of them that I have. Well, Groucho and Me is written by you know Groucho. Yes. And, yeah. um, I recently reread it, and the first two thirds of it are, are are wonderful, and then it kind of I have to say it meanders a bit. He kind of gets more into mm. kind of entertainment mode. But it's still worth, if you're a fan of Groucho and show business, the struggle of, of, of early vaudevillians like yes. Groucho and his brother is palpable and heartbreaking. And it makes you, it puts you in a state of awe when you, when you realize what he was, they were able to accomplish. And right. that the fact that they did it at all and survived and conquered. Uh, it's, it's wonderful. It, it, um, you know, the, his relationship with Chico is interesting and the family dynamic is fascinating. So yes, to your, to your viewers, I'd say read Groucho and me. And of course, Harpo Speaks is one of the great autobiographies yeah, in, in, in the performing arts. And this is the one I have from, from Bill. And right. He, and he actually signed mine. Right. Bill is a wonderful, wonderful he, man. Yeah, he signed it for me. He, he's awesome.
he is an incredibly kind man. I saw him, I guess a little over, I guess back in January, I saw him. Um, I'll see him again. He lives in the desert. I live in California, Los Angeles. And uh, I saw him and he just said, you're still doing it. Keep it going, Frank. Keep it going. That's right. And that means a lot because he could say That's enough funny. already. I should, <laughs> but it's a, no, he knows but, you have the passion and the desire to do it. And I, yeah. that, that says a lot from him. And I think he, and I, I know he, I agree. And he knows how much I respect his family. Absolutely. Uh, in the big picture. And, uh, and that I actually had intimate relationships with his cousins, uh, Miriam and, and Arthur. And I think uh, he knows how much I loved Miriam, who really is a hero. Yeah, that's a, that's a beautiful yeah. book, and it shows a side of Groucho that you won't see anywhere else. You and, know. and actually, too, uh, Frank, is you have an audio CD of that. I do. We and did. I a, think we, that's an awesome, you know, approach too. I mean, to really listen to you, you're you're listening to Groucho. Yeah, I, it was. Know. I was honored to do that. Miriam was alive, and she provides some of the narration, and I read the letters of her father and again very moving because of Miriam's struggles with 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 alcohol mm -hmm. and um you know she did recover in the last 40 years of her life she was able to kind of regain she did regain her life and she did rebuild her life she had to learn how to drive again make coffee again read again but she'd been you know she was um she was in foster care or in, in rehab and um, institutions lived on the streets she had a rough you know, she started drinking in her late teens and stopped when she was 50. She doesn't remember the entire decade of the mm. 1960s. She's a, you know, as Bill said, she, Bill would refer to Miriam as his hero because what she did was she, re, she did make that shift, mm. which is almost impossible to do. Right. And she did it the year her father died in 1977. She lived another 40 years and Groucho never got to see that recovery. Mm. And I think about Groucho's pain as a father of two and he loved her so much and that you know Miriam may have been Groucho's favorite person I, I would that's there's an argument for that and if you read those letters you'll you probably will most people would agree but as a dad to right. see your kid and not be able to do with all the power and all the money and all the fame nothing you can do to help someone with an addiction like that. Nothing. You can throw money at them. You could take money away. You can have tough love. You can, at some point, you have to live with the agony That's correct. Of, of, the, of your most beloved person in pain. Mm. And, but she came through and she published this beautiful book and was able to speak to it. She used to travel, Brad, all over the country to see me do shows. She spent her holidays with me. She knew my grandmother and my mother and my uncles and aunts and cousins and brothers. And we'd celebrate Christmas and birthdays and Thanksgiving together, and um, no, no one really knows that. I mean, I was I was her, I was her trustee at the end sure. of her life. I, I helped take care of her, and um, I loved her very much. She was oh, a wow. dear dear friend, and she was family to me. Absolutely. But um, yeah. I think uh, Bill, you know, I didn't want to be in that position. One of her older friends said, "You know, you're younger. She loves you. She, we trust you. Can you help?" And, and I didn't know what a trustee had to do. Boy, did I find out, mm -hmm. which has helped me now because I can help other people in my life who need it to, who are related to me. I learned a lot being a trustee in terms yeah. of how to help people with their finances and their health situations, hospitalizations, medications, all of it. And so uh, I, it almost, you know, in a way, I always felt like I got so much from that Marx family from Groucho. I'm glad I was able to step up and return absolutely what I received and no one else has been in that position. I know that, but there's a lot I don't talk about. I'm telling you, but there was a, a real sense of being able to return. And I did it not because, you know, the, maybe there's some obligation, but mostly I, I just loved her and I knew her separate from Groucho. I loved Miriam. I could say the same thing about Arthur. Arthur was Groucho, you know, I knew I knew Miriam for 32 years. I knew Arthur for 25 years until they passed away. Both lived long lives. Arthur was 89. Miriam was 90. But uh, I always wished Arthur was and chokes me up, was 30 years younger because I'd sit in his backyard in Bel Air and we'd watch the sunset and we'd have a cocktail. And I don't smoke cigars that often, but I happen to be smoking one in his backyard. And I'm looking at him going, I love this person. He's like, he's a peer, he's my friend. And we survived a 
a New York and London show together. And that was years ago. And we have a friendship. We have a bond. Mm -hmm. And I'm smoking the cigar and I, we're about to go inside his house. And I put the cigar on in the ashtray. I didn't want to bring it in the house. And I walk into through the screen door and the, you know, the sliding glass door. And we're now in this beautiful home in Bel Air. And he goes, what happened? What'd you do? I said, where's your cigar? I said, well, Arthur, I put the cigar outside. I want to bring the smoke in. He goes, no, bring it in. He says, it reminds me of my father. Mm. But, oh, yes. cause he had, a, he had a kind of a love hate thing with his sure. father. His dad, Art Groucho was tough. You know, it wasn't easy to be the son and daughter of someone like that. A very complicated life that he had Groucho. And we all have complicated lives. Yeah. You know, we pretend there's nothing simple. It's not simple to exist on the planet. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, Frank, it, it it shows anyway that you have passion and you care. And not not just you're you know, as a performer, but as a human being. I appreciate that. And Thank and you. and I've said it before, uh, you have class on stage and off stage. Thank you. That's for kind so do you and I thank you. Oh, thank thank you. you for your class right now and your uh for being so gracious and thank you for your hospitality oh, and support oh, okay. over the years, Brad. Absolutely, I appreciate absolutely. it. Absolutely. And I'm still going to continue. I, I'm grateful. <laughs> thank you. You're very welcome. Uh, Frank, I'm going to, I have to do this. I have to put my, ah! <laughs> and I got, it's not, it's not the Dunhill 410, but it'll do. <laughs> there you go. You got to say yeah. something though. You can't stop there. You have to help me though. No, no, you, oh. you, you, I'm sure you've got a line you can come up with your favorite Groucho line. Well, we must be going. There it is, folks. He <laughs> must be going. That's right. Lala. La. I, I, I thank you so much, and you have a wonderful day, and I wish you the very best. You too, Brad. Thank you. I appreciate you. the support. You, Take course. care. You too, Frank. Bye-bye. Right. Bye-bye.